I'm going to try and uh, make do with uh, talking about some images and a little bit about artwork. And I just wanted to mention also, um, thank you, Joanne. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for uh, everybody at the staff here at the Indianapolis Museum. Um, Rachel Heisinga also and um, Madupe for, for shepherding everybody through here, which I know is not easy in taking these questions. Um, I want to touch on just, I guess, in sort of brief and broad sketch ways, uh, a few things that, that come to mind for me. One of them is artistic genealogy. One of them is uh, assemblage. Uh, the other is classical black American art. And then lastly, neo hoodoo. Um, going through a variety of images and touching upon an artistic genealogy, I'd like to address Thornton Dial briefly from the purview of a curator deeply interested in the ways in which visual art is disseminated in light of race and style. Within that exploration or concern is the idea of the shadow and the act, or reality versus illusion. What is the act and how is it perceived? Are we still perpetrating a shadow existence when the act is enough? Is that remarkable? And at heart, though the shadow and the act here refer only in a liminal way to Ellison's quest to reconcile, often through himself as an artist, Ralph Ellison that is, the place of the black artist in the peculiar shadows of American culture, and does this even still matter? In a perfect world, there would be no need for an artist, curator, or writer to respond to essentializing gazes and preconceptions, to become caught up in a world of naysayers defining the fabric of one's own consciousness. Yet I think back to Du Bois's words, his summary term, double consciousness, is still so resonant. The Negro is a sort of seventh son born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. More than a century later, it is a wonder how those words still often ring true. I'm not sure if it was the fact that I grew up in Harlem with strong ties to a family in the deep southern part of Georgia, or if it was when I saw Jean-Michel Basquiat on the cover of the New York Times Magazine, barefoot with an Armani suit on, that I first became obsessed with the Afro-Atlantic and the black presence in the new world via contemporary art, but it was somewhere between those two experiences. Tate has said, everything I've ever written betrays my obsession Black modernity and its discontents. Black modernity and its dissonance. Black modernity and its dissidents. All the tricksters bent on expanding and or obliterating the envelope in which American blackness has been apprehended. That was from 1999 and I'm still, I still return to this essay that, that he wrote in other narratives, a, a little exhibition catalog from the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston. Um, yet today, it also begs the question recently posed by the art historian Darby English, what becomes of black art when black artists stop making it? Without being much, much remarked upon as yet, the category's instability now defines it far more clearly than do its supposed contents, as black art has come to have less and less descriptive bearing, which is not to say influence on the work many black artists actually produce. I've been consumed by some of these questions for my thinking life. 
Um, one of the things I wanted to just to, to pause on and think about and, and really um, thank you so much again for the opportunity to see the work here. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about in relation to that was where did I begin to see it? How did I begin to see it? And one of the things that, that strikes me in thinking about the work again now is, you know, emphasis or emphasis not on representation and abstraction and how Dial's work explores both of these things and is constantly sort of on the line between these two things that are always still such a part of any contemporary art discourse. Um, just a couple of pieces uh, that bring to mind, I guess I'd have to say, you know, an, a tradition that um, has been remarked upon a little bit in terms of arte povera and, you know, thinking about a lot of this abstract work is having something to do with, say, Piero Manzoni, Alberto Buri, um, artists who used found and raw materials in ways similar, perhaps, to Dial or to even Theaster. Uh, but there's something different, and I think you really, I mean, you, it's something that you can't see in the reproduction. So, you know, I, I did get to run around a little bit, I guess, during lunchtime, and just, it's, that work is so much about presence um, that it's, it's hard to, to quite take it all in without being in front of it. Um, a couple of these works just put me in that frame of mind. It's like, it's um, a space that is also about abstraction, but it's also very much about materiality and the way that we feel artwork. It also reminds me that, you know, we talk about these certain terms within art and art history, and I think of um, Arte Povera as being this one where you have this very sort of definitive camp in uh, Italian post-war traditions. And it's something that you can't really feel or really look at, I think, without thinking about a black American tradition. Um, and obviously, Dial's work brings that to the fore. The first time I saw Thornton Dial's work was at uh, the New Museum in New York, and that was for the big exhibition in 1993. And, and I remember, I mean, I, I think Joanne will know this, um, there was a video playing, I think, where he was interviewed by the artist Nari Ward. And this is a work of, of Nari's. Um, an artist that, you know, in hindsight, I was discussing his work at the time. I think we were doing a series of interviews and discussing it in light of Arte Povera, and he was particularly, you know, interested in that. But it's also, I think, telling that I came to Dial's work through uh, another artist like this. And that's part of what I hope to, to, to show with some of these images is the connections between artists. Um, I just remember Nari speaking so uh, reverently of Dial's work and thinking about the connections with his own work as a younger artist. This piece here is a piece that's made out of um, hose, out of, uh, you know, from fire hoses, uh, as similar to some of the work that we see in the galleries and similar to some of the work that Theaster showed, uh, also mixed with rope. Um, another artist that was around at that time uh, was Leonardo Drew. And both of these artists are so, so uh, ensconced in, in material in quite similar ways. Um, and that's a material that, you know, although most of the work, I guess, at this time was being made uptown New York City, it had a very definitive stance that harked back to a place where Dial's work is coming from and from that American South, South tradition. Um, I'm showing you the back of uh, Welcome to Peckerwood first, just to, to think about some of those ties in terms of material and, and the tr tradition of artists using that material. <coughs> and then the front. Um, I don't know, for me, this is one of those pieces that also kind of references um, where everything looks so wrong that it's right. You know, everything is just a little bit off. 
Um, and I think that's another hallmark of this tradition. There's no knob on that door. There's a welcome mat that leads you to this almost nowhere space. You know, when we talked about um, the meanings, I guess, behind the title and behind the piece and all of these sort of political overtones. Um, so work that also conjures the work of uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat for me. And that would be my sort of second experiences with the work of Dial on a real face-to-face -face level was in 2005 uh, at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. This is a work by Jean-Michel Basquiat called Griot from 1984 and a similar sort of standing uh, door-like piece. I think also uh, it is a piece that is inviting but at the same time it is a piece that wants you to sort of uh, back off or, or think about um, its pieces reverently. Also talking about traditions of uh, Afro-Atlantic traditions and the usage of the crown here being very much like the tiger, I think as a sign for dial. There you see both of them. Um, you know, and it was, I, I mean, I don't know the, the circumstances of these two exhibitions being up at exactly the same time in Houston, but it was phenomenal. It was absolutely phenomenal and, was, and, and rarely remarked upon. Um, the, the sort of similarities and I guess what we called um, convergences and differences uh, of seeing these two bodies of work with so much interest in subjectivity, so much interest in paint handling, um, so many different qualities that just share uh, a lot of interesting things together. The flag. Um, also thinking about now and thinking about Dial in the present and how much this work is so consumed with America and with an ongoing changing vision of America. I mean, even in thinking about this work from the preceding piece, you know, so much um, change as we have talked about through today. Um, also reminds me of how the flag has been used in other artists' work, um, people like David Hammonds, who also shares, um, I think, something of, of dials, and I want to say performative, although I'm not sure it really is, performative, silence, exile, and cunning uh, is something that I would attach to both of them. Uh, here, Hammonds is also using the flag to make a point. Uh, in this case, in Justice case, which goes back to that um, 1968 Democratic Convention and actions of Bobby Seale, and this is the, the trial after where he's been bound to the chair, and this is a work where uh, David Hammonds goes directly to that, that physical space, but also using the flag in a way. And this question of America also comes up now in another exhibition that, that is up at the same time and opened, I guess, shortly after the uh, exhibition opened here. Another artist who is consumed by America, albeit coming from a different formal place, perhaps, um, but Glenn Ligon, and recently he did a series of neons all looking at this word, you know, not like Hammonds and Dial using the flag specifically, but just using the word to conjure the sort of many different ways in which we uh, think about that word and think about the passage of time and think about, uh, for him it was in light of the election of Obama where he was putting a renewed emphasis uh, on the word. Glenn likewise has a sense of humor. Um, I don't know if you can make that out. I went to Africa, I went to the motherland to find my roots, right? 700 million black people, not one of those motherfuckers knew me. Um, one of Glenn's Richard Pryor paintings, also <laughs> really about America. Um, and that just brings me to the art of Alabama. Um, thinking about dial and thinking about assemblage and again just being in front of the work going upstairs and standing and, and forgetting how much we are dwarfed by this assemblage piece um, and just wanted to, to think about that in relation to uh, a wider history. Um, of course, you know, we've talked about the work and dial using all of these, these classic uh, 
traditions and then dangling the sort of specter of uh, a Western cultural tradition sort of hanging from the bottom there that uh, in the uh, yellow sculpture. Um, another artist from Alabama, born in 1917, Noah Purifoy, who also is very much involved with an assemblage tradition and just somebody that, that keeps uh, coming up for me in terms of the conversation around Dial's work and someone who likewise uh, needs to be seen more of. Um, these are a few pieces from a work he did called 66 Signs of Neon, made completely out of found artifacts uh, from the detritus of the uh, uh, Watts rebellions. And this is his uh, Dial's, no, this is Purifoy's Joshua Tree, which is where he lived and worked from 1989 to 2004. And just thinking again about that, that tradition, you know, we talked about yard sculpture, we talked about um, uh, how much of a facet of a more historical, more classical black American art space that that work is and how few people still know that in terms of art history. But obviously, you know, that's what's going on here. And then thinking a little bit further backwards, um, to Kurt Schwitters. And, and again, throwing, I guess, in that idea of a European tradition where, you know, as, as if um, assemblage came out of this place that was from Dada and Surrealism, and in the Western tradition is discussed in that way, you know, th with this, this juxtaposition of different materials, which is very similar, um, but something that also goes, you know, quite less remarked upon uh, is what was happening here and what was happening in the southern United States before the turn of the century. Um, then thinking about the term assemblage and thinking about du buffet, um, you know, the term, I guess, of assemblage that we use, sort of throw it around in terms of, of a lot of this work, um, is something that became only a real part of the lexicon of art history in the 60s. Uh, and Du Buffet was you know, a major proponent of that work. So also thinking about those sort of connections. And then taking it back. Um, this is a bottle tree um, from, you know, from a, a, a yard in the south. And then uh, William Edmondson. Um, this is a shot that Edward Weston took in 1941 of his sculpture garden and in the mind of quilts and of that tradition. And all of these things providing this huge historical backdrop um, for Dial and for many artists. Um, just also uh, another Alabama artist, um, Christenberry, uh, born in 1936 near Tuscaloosa. And lastly, just want to remark upon John Outerbridge, um, artist from North Carolina, born 1933, also using found materials and uh, creating assemblage sculptures. Um, Neo Hoodoo, and you know, Greg talked about this earlier. Um, for me, it was, uh, I guess, in my mouth, Neo Hoodoo was this this sort of gaudy word that doesn't readily roll off of the tongue. Um, it is playful, but is also awkward sounding. The designation here of an art for a forgotten faith, which is what we called the exhibition, uh, was something that Ishmael Reed came up with. And in this exhibition, wanting to talk about, you know, this, this sense of groundedness in a history. So this is a work by Gary Simmons that comes directly from those traditional yard sculptures and from the bottle trees. David Hammond, similarly, thinking about those sort of things. This work is made out of little bottles of um, night train and thinking about, I think, you know, this idea of the circle and, and, and ritual. Um, another thing that comes out of that space is thinking about not only the tradition and the history that we are building upon, but also what was it that uh, we look for in our museums. And one of the things that I was thinking of was looking very specifically at uh, Reed's mumbo jumbo and thinking about you know, this mystery of these guys who go to 
the Center for Art Detention, which happens to be at 82nd Street and Fifth Avenue in New York City, uh, otherwise known as the Metropolitan Museum, and where they're rescuing you know, the artifacts, the Olmec artifacts, African artifacts. Uh, so this idea of how do we even begin to look at an artist like Thornton Dial if we don't know historically where the work is coming from. And, you know, in some ways I'm trying to think of, okay, it is this melange of um, experiences and thinking about art, I, I think, in a wider context. And as a curator, that's what we're looking to do. But it also is about thinking about concepts of looking at art in the museum and how they can be perhaps wrong. Um, so much, I think, of Dial's work, or like a lot of graffiti for that matter, was meant to be seen outside and in spaces um, where it is used, very much in the tradition of African art. You know, Farris Thompson talks about African art in motion, this idea that the object is the thing that's constantly moving around you, and not you moving around the work of art, as we do here in the museum. Um, this piece by Sanford Biggers is, is getting at some of those ideas. Do we get down low and sort of look at the work with one knee on the ground? Do we look at it at 60 inches or whatever, the way we would a normal painting? Um, how are you supposed to experience the work of art? And I think that's some of the things that we encounter with Dial's work and love with the three-dimensional works, the way that they are set up, sort of like anchors throughout the galleries where you actually experience them 360 degrees. Um, lastly, uh, this piece by Radcliffe Bailey, also hinting at exactly that idea of a base in a sort of African art historical tradition, which then via a middle passage that Dial talks about so much in his work. Um, what are the ties that bind? And thank you. <laughs>